Welcome everyone and thank you for attending our presentation, A New Bird Banding Station Lands in Chicago, presented on behalf of volunteer bird banders with the Chicago Ornithological Society. Uh, my name is Stephanie Bilkey and I'm a COS board member and bird mander and today I'm co-presenting with my fellow bird banders who will introduce themselves. Hey, I'm Libby Keys. I'm also a bird bander at the Big Marsh Station. And I'm Anastasia Rollin. I'm an ornithologist with the Illinois Natural History Survey and the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Thanks, Libby and Anastasia. First, I'd like to acknowledge our partners who helped to make this project happen. Thank you to the Chicago Park District for allowing us to do this work at Big Marsh. And thank you as well to the Institute for Bird Population, which oversees the MAPS bird banning program of which this program is a part of. And uh, thank you to the USGS Bird Banding Lab, the government agency that oversees and permits all bird banding activities. First, let's start from where our bird banding station is located and I'll talk a little bit about why it's so special. Big Marsh Park is located in Chicago's Calumet region. The Calumet region stretches across uh, the southern shore of Lake Michigan and reaches all the way from Chicago to Southwest Michigan. The area is well known for its important wetlands and natural areas, as well as its importance to the steel industry. Big Marsh is located just east of Lake Calumet and is part of the Lake Calumet important bird area. These areas were designated as important for breeding water wetland birds and as critical stopover sites for shorebirds and waterfowl. In the last few decades, there's been an increasing focus on restoring natural areas of the Calumet region and with that, it's important to understand how birds respond to restoration within an urban industrial landscape. Like many stakeholders in the, in the Calumet region, Chicago Ornithological Society is invested in the, most, in the important natural areas of the Calumet region. Our organization put together a Calumet plan which focuses on bringing awareness and understanding to Calumet's natural areas and gaining a better understanding of the bird species using these sites. Phase one of these efforts, where we are now, focuses on bringing more birders to places like Big Marsh and also launching our organization's first ever bird banding station, which we will be talking about more today. Later, phases two and three will focus on expanding our presence and in, uh, expanding COS's presence by working on building more permanent infrastructure through radio tracking towers that can help us study bird migration as well as leaving a lasting legacy in Calumet through annual birding festivals and birding trails. Focusing back on our phase one bird banding station, we know there are a lot of birds in Calumet and we are excited to share these birds by showcasing them on our bird walks. But first we have some questions. Are these populations striving and surviving? There is a lot we can discover about birds by watching them through binoculars but bird banding helps us take our collective knowledge one step further by having a bird in the hand. For our bird banding station, we follow the Monitoring Avian Productivity and Survivorship Protocol, or MAPS protocol, through the Institute of Bird Populations. This special protocol takes place only during the breeding season and lets us ask important questions like, what are baseline levels of productivity and survivorship of birds within an urban industrial landscape like Big Marsh? Meaning how many young do they produce and how long do these birds live? and what bird species are successful at breeding here. Next, I'll turn it over to Anastasia, who will tell us more about why we ban birds and what other questions it helps us answer. And we'll just start off with a quick video. So this is a house wren, very feisty. Keep them from flapping. We keep them in a very special grip called a bander's grip. And I can just have his, his head kind of poking out through my fingers, but the rest of my hand is closed around his wings so he can't flap around and that keeps him relatively calm. So the first thing that we do when we band birds is put a band on their leg. And so we have to know what species we have, which I said this is a house wren, which we have a lot of them here at Big Marsh. And uh, they take a size zero band, which is one of our smallest bands. Of course, they are pretty tiny little guys. So um, I have our bands down here. And I'll just show you, this is, this is how tiny that band is. It's made out of aluminum. 
and I probably can't see that it has a little number on there, nine digit number. So if this bird is ever captured again, we can find out where it was banded and um, how old it was when we captured it, all of that kind of stuff, all this data that we're gonna take down today. So as you can see, all of, all of these birds uh, have different sized legs and so they require different sized bands like Stephanie was mentioning. And if you look over to the right, you'll notice that the red-headed woodpecker actually has color bands on. And so color bands will help us tell birds apart in the field um, using binoculars. Uh, and so why do we ban birds? Um, like Stephanie mentioned, we ban birds as part of a larger monitoring effort with the Institute for Bird Populations uh, through the MAPS program. And I'm going to talk to you about some of the things that we can learn uh, from banding data. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we can measure is bird diversity or which species of birds we find in an area. So some species of birds are skulky and they're difficult to spot by sight and sound but we can catch them through passive mist netting. Another thing we might wanna know is when birds breed. And so we can measure the timing of reproduction if we consistently ban birds through the breeding season. And birds will go into breeding condition, meaning they'll develop brood patches when incubating eggs and nestlings, which we can measure with the bird in the hand. And we can track how the timing of reproduction varies from year to year. We can also measure recruitment, which is when an adult produces chicks and those chicks return to the same location to breed the following year. Um, recruitment measures the number of new birds recruited to breed where we're banding. And it tells us something about how well that habitat is doing at supporting these birds. Next slide. <clears throat> we're also interested in how long birds live. Obviously birds don't go gray or need glasses as they age. Uh, but this is my cartoon of a bird aging. By banding birds and recapturing them year after year, we can measure the survival of individuals. And so about a third of birds at banding stations are recaptured the following year. And since we know the birds age from the previous year, we know when we capture it again that it's one year older. Um, finally, the banding station at Big Marsh is a MAPS breeding station, which focuses on capturing birds during the breeding season. Uh, but other banding stations will capture birds during migration. And so this kind of banding lets us know if the timing of migration is shifting year after year, which is important when thinking about managing and conserving birds. So all of these data, bird diversity, survival, recruitment, migration, and reproduction are important for figuring out bird population trends over time. Um, so over the years, uh, the MAPS banning program, um, the Institute for Bird Populations has instituted MAPS banning stations all over North America and Canada in almost every single state in North America and province in Canada. And by aggregating all of these data together that all of these MAPS banning stations are collecting, we can figure out if bird populations are increasing or decreasing across, uh, across the Americas. So next, I'm just going to talk quickly about some of the recent research that has come out of these efforts. Um, so the first study, integrating broad scale data to assess demographic and climatic conditions to population change in a declining songbird, uh, looks at demography and climate change and how it affects Wilson warbler declines. Uh, and this study uses both MAPS and BBS data. The next study about yearlings um, looks at how second years second year birds of 29 species choose habitat. And finally, the last study about phenology and productivity in a montane bird assemblage uses MAPS breeding data and looks at how the timing of breeding in multiple species of birds varies across entire mountain ranges. And so these kinds of studies are just a small subset of the kind of research questions that can be answered using MAPS data. So that's it for me, and I'm going to turn this over now to Libby, who will show us how we catch birds. All right. Um, so uh, when we start banding, a day of banding starts at dawn um, with nets set up. 
Um, and before the, the season even starts, what we have to do is we have to clear what we call net lanes. Um, and that's where we set the nets up and we have to make sure that there's no overhanging branches to snag the nets. Um, and we set the poles up at the right length. And you can see the poles here in the middle that they're very high, um, maybe around 12, 15 feet high. And that's how high the nets are. Um, and we actually store the nets between banding sessions and something like a grocery bag uh, when they're not in use and setting them up can take a lot of practice. There's different net types and lengths that can be used when targeting different birds, but we generally use about um, 12 meter long, 30 millimeter mesh, four tiered black nylon nets. And these are best for catching smaller songbirds. So heavier duty, stronger nets might be used for larger birds or even different colors for different habitats. Uh, and now these nets just aren't solid mesh. So they have these stronger lines running horizontally through them called trammels. And the goal is to set these trammels at the perfect distance from each other, about 12 inches. And what this does is it creates a pocket of mesh. And when it's exactly right, the bird hits that pocket and falls into it. If the trammels are too far apart, the bird will just bounce out of the pocket. And if they're too close together, the bird might get caught in two different shelves, what we call double bagged, and that makes them really difficult to get out of the net. So checking that placement while banding is really important. Um, now for MAPS bird banding protocol, which is what we're doing, we place seven of these very fine mist nets stretched between two poles, and we open them periodically throughout the summer months or the breeding months. Um, about every 10 days for about 10 weeks. So the nets are open from sunrise until about noon and we check them every half an hour. And at the end of the day, of course, we close the nets and we take them down. Um, but once they're set up, again, we check those nets every half an hour, um, but this is variable too. So because we're focusing on small birds and we're banding in the summer when it's hot, uh, we check pretty often so that no bird is sitting in the net for very long. Sometimes the nets are empty when we check them and sometimes we have multiple birds, five or more in the net at the same time. And removing a bird from the net is something that takes a lot of practice. These nets are really fine and they can be super hard to see around the bird. So you have to be really careful not to pull too hard or injure the bird when you're getting it out. But once the bird is re removed, we place it into a special cloth bag to bring it back to the banding station. Um, these bags are a really great way to carry, carry the birds. Um, it's kind of like a falconer putting a hood on their bird. Um, it helps keep the birds calm until it's time to process them since the birds can't see us and they stay in the bags until they're, we're ready to ban them. So let's take a look at a net set up in the field this past summer. Um, we'll be able to see just how difficult it is to see the nets when they're set up, even when you're right next to them. So this is a mist net. It's uh, very hard to see and that's important because the birds can't see it so they're able to fly into it. But if you can see right here, there's all these pockets. So if a bird flies into a pocket, it drops in here and it gets kind of tangled in the netting. And then we come by and we take them out. So it looks like we didn't catch anything in this net. So we just want to make sure. So we do a walk by and just check every little corner of the net just in case a bird is hiding. So that's, that's what a mist net looks like. All right, and now we're gonna talk about um, the types of data we collect and also the specialized tools that we use to collect the data. All right, so once a bird is out of the net and it's back at the banding table, we can start the process of collecting the data. Uh, next slide. And the first step that we have to do is IDing the bird. And that might seem like a given, um, but for some species that look really similar, um, I'm sure a lot of us are familiar with the frustrations of flycatchers. Um, IDing can be a surprisingly difficult process even when we have those birds in the hand. And this is really important because it determines things like what band size we put on and sometimes how the bird is aged as well. So once we have that correct ID, we open what a lot of banders affectionately call the bird banding Bible. Um, that's the Identification Guide to North American Birds by Peter Pyle and it has an incredible amount of information about all the species that we'll see during banding. So once we check the band size um, using our specialized leg gauge, um, remember each, uh, each band um, 
has a unique nine digit number. So we record and we double check that band number um, and it's completely unique. So this is essentially the bird's new ID. And we use special banding pliers as well to open and close the band. So they have pins to open the bands evenly and special notches that correspond with the band sizes. And that ensures that the band stays circular and it closes completely and doesn't overlap on itself on the bird's leg. Next slide. Uh, so next what we do is called processing. So banding is most useful when we take really accurate measurements and plumage descriptions, but also as quickly as we can to avoid overstressing the birds. So one of the first measurements we take is wing and tail length. And we do this with, with specialized rulers. Um, they have an upright edge to measure the length of the wing. We also look at fat levels and these can change drastically, not only throughout a season, but throughout a day as well. So in that lower picture under fat levels, you can see that pink color is muscle, but that yellow color is fat. And so we can score a bird based on where it's holding fat and how much. We also weigh the bird. And often um, we do this last just in case they get loose. And we usually do this by weighing them on a scale in a little container. And those containers are smooth and small enough to hold the bird's body um, so they can't push out of it. And they're often really calm and probably confused when we weigh them like this, but it only takes a few seconds. And beyond those common measurements, uh, there's another, a number of other things that are often measured, things like bill length and width, um, leg and foot measurements, crown patch size. Often we do something so called sculling, which sounds aggressive, but it's just taking a little water and parting the feathers on their head to see how formed um, their actual skull is, which can help age them. Um, and even things like taking feather and blood samples. So all these can be done or not done depending on the project. And then finally, we have to age and sex the bird. Um, those are the other two big things that we have to do. Now, sexing is usually pretty straightforward. A lot of birds are what we call sexually dimorphic. They have plumage differences and we're banding during the breeding season. So there's often, not always, but usually there's physiological differences as well. So during the breeding season, adult males will develop enlarged cloacal protuberances, which function in sperm storage and transfer and females develop the brood patch. Um, and that means they lose feathers on their belly and the skin becomes really vascularized and full of fluid. And that helps transfer heat from the body to the eggs. But of course, in some species like woodpeckers, males will also help incubate the eggs. So we can't always use that brood patch to determine if a bird is male or female. And then finally, we have to age the bird. And aging can be one of the most complicated things we do as a part of processing. Um, it's not always straightforward and it's way more involved than this pretty simplified explanation. But essentially we can look at a bird's feathers to determine its age. So things like shape and color and wear. And again, this is where we crack open pile. Um, feathers aren't permanent structures and tend, they tend to be lost in pretty predictable patterns, which means that if we're familiar with those patterns, we can determine where in a cycle a bird is. So in the simplest terms, birds cycle between molts and plumages. And I like to think of molts as an action. So they're actively replacing feathers and plumage as a state. So this would be like breeding versus non-breeding plumages you're probably familiar with in a lot of birds. So think like winter versus breeding male American goldfinch in the summer. Those different plumages require the active molting of feathers in between. Some of our local birds complete this cycle once a year, some twice. It depends on their molt strategy uh, and Pyle has those all listed. Now birds are aged by calendar year and each bird has their birthday on January 1st. So any bird that's born this coming spring will be known as a hatch year bird. And on January 1st of next year, every bird that's hatched this year will be a second year bird and so on and so on. And there's a lot of unknowns here and we often can't age birds past the second or third year. Um, or sometimes even hatch year. So they're known as after hatch year. Um, so now that we've taken a look at some of the banding um, data that we collect in the field, let's watch a little video of Stephanie Wang and releasing a bird after banding. All right, so I'm gonna show you how we weigh the bird. You just turn on the scale and we have these little orange tubes that are used by pharmacists to give out prescription medication. But then we put the bird in these tubes because it keeps them nice and contained and it's nice and smooth so they kind of slide in and out of there. And the bird goes in there. And we got 12.9 grams. All 
right? And now this bird is ready to go. Bye. All right. All right, so I'll pass it back over to Stephanie and we'll meet some of the birds that we caught this summer at Big Marsh. All right, thanks Libby. So I'm going to go over some of our most common captures um, from our Big Marsh banding. So after our first summer of banding, we caught um, our, our number one capture was the gray catbird, which we had 44 of. And a second runner up is a yellow warbler with 34. Um, other common species were American robin, 25, um, 19 house wrens, and 18 song sparrows. Some of our less common captures were species that were likely breeding at Big Marsh, but found our nets less frequently. We only banded one American red start, uh, one Eastern kingbird. Note that uh, crown patch, which gives the kingbird its name. I have that pointed out in the, in the, the that picture in the upper left of the, the kingbird. And then uh, just one uh, Baltimore Oriole and a few blue gray gnat catchers. In total, we conducted approximately 30 hours of banding or also known as 204 uh, net hours, which is just the total number of hours that nets were open added all together in, um, in our first year of banding. And that was over the course of five days in the field. Um, during that time, we banded 202 birds of 21 species. Pictured here from left to right are a couple other species that we found. So um, left to right, that's field sparrow, common yellow throat male, uh, male American goldfinch, male indigo bunting, uh, willow flycatcher, and a female northern flicker. In uh, in, in 2021, we're excited to resume bird banding again, starting in the spring, and we hope to add additional nets so we can better sample the marsh habitat at Big Marsh. Um, we also hope to add public engagement opportunities, though we will have to wait and see what restrictions there will be um, this summer uh, to invite the public out to the station. So please stay tuned to our COS website and social media to find, about, find out more about those opportunities. If you're interested in learning more about our banding station or volunteer opportunities, please follow the COS blog at chicagoburger.org slash blog, or you can contact us at calumet at chicagoburger.org. All right, and thanks for tuning into our Wild Things presentation, and we can't wait to see you someday in the field. Thank you so much. Thank you.